Okay, thanks so much for rejoining us. Um, our final panel of the day is the Standards Development Panel. With us, we have Michael Murray, President of Mission Data, and Doug Hausman, Grid Modernization Lead at Burns and McDonnell. Uh, Mr. Murray, I believe you're up first. Thank you, Mr. Chairman and Commissioners. Um, I'm happy to be here. I know this is uh, at the end of a, a long day, so I, I'm going to try to keep this interesting. Um, I'm really excited to talk about one um, area of standards that hasn't been talked about thus far today, and that is goes it goes to one of what the previous speaker was talking about uh, with regard to you know what does all this grid modernization stuff mean to customers at the end of the day? What are the direct benefits that a customer gets? So indirect benefits could be things like you know reduced outages, but what does a customer actually get? that they don't have before with a modernized grid. And to a large extent, uh, in my view, this um, can be, uh, this, this value is really delivered through um, customer access to their own usage data and the, the portability around access to that usage data. And so this is gonna be uh, the, the subject of this, this presentation. Um, I'm the co-founder and president of Mission Data. We're a nonprofit organization. I live in Seattle, Washington. Uh, we have um, over uh, 40 members that represent about a billion dollars a year of energy management business uh, in North America. Um, I've been a part of um, uh, data access, meaning you know how do customers access their their own personal energy usage information for a number of years, uh, working with the California Public Utilities Commission and and others on these topics. We've been active in about 14 states. Um, <clears throat> and, uh, and so I'm excited to, to tell you a little bit about our work and how I think these, um, some of these concepts around standards can, can be put to use here in Ohio. So um, to put this in context, uh, the portability of customer energy usage data actually has its origins uh, in, in many respects to this, this one statement uh, from a, a federal government agency in 2010. Um, I'll let you take a guess at who said this. They said, uh, to ensure that America leads in the clean energy economy, every American should be able uh, to use broadband to track and manage their real-time energy consumption. Guess which federal agency said this in 2010? Uh, it's actually the FCC in the National Broadband Plan. And through a number of federal acts, um, including ESA in 2007 and others, uh, NIST was charged with uh, responsibility for developing grid interoperability standards. And the thought was if Department of Energy is going to put five or six billion dollars of ratepayer funds towards smart grid and smart meters, you might as, it'd be a good idea to have some interoperability standards so that you can get the most out of that investment. So Open ADR is a standard that's been talked about, um, but one of the cousins of Open ADR, which is what I'm going to talk about today, is known as Green Button and that's your own personal energy usage and cost information. This is a growing trend. Um, we, I'm happy to say we now have about 25 million meters across the U.S. that uh, are under a policy where the customer has the right to uh, transmit their own electricity usage information to any provider of their choice. Uh, this began in, uh, in California, but it's also moved to um, you know, Texas, and in the last year, we've had uh, um, agreements in New York to require those utilities to use the green button standard. Um, and in Colorado, we uh, just a couple months ago had a unanimous settlement agreement with 11 different parties uh, concerning a $600 million uh, smart grid and smart meter investment. Um, and as part of that deployment, over the next four years, they will be deploying the uh, green button standard there as well. So I'll tell you a little bit about what the standard means and what exactly can you do with it um, once it's in place. When we talk about platforms coming from the tech community, I uh, co-founded and ran a, an IoT energy management company for 10 years. Um, the word platform has a certain meaning. Um, one of the, it was a great presentation this morning about platforms and one of the things that's important is that it's hard to imagine all the realm of different technologies that can come into play in the future. And uh, we talked about this, you know, what does it mean to have a future-proofed grid? Well, I'll show you some of these uh, apps that are uh, made by our, our member companies about some of the things that are happening now in other parts of the country that, that you may not be aware of. 
Uh, in this case, a company called OhmConnect um, has a, a, a game that uh, if you're in the state of California, can, uh, you can give them control over your air conditioners or other smart devices in the home. You can also participate with your own behavior and earn points in the game. So those points can be used to outdo your peers or your friends. Um, they can be exchanged for uh, uh, reward cards at Starbucks and things like that. Um, you can also convert it into cash into your PayPal account um, or, or donate it to charity. So they're households that can earn between $100 and $150 a year by participating in this. Um, this is sort of a, a, an interesting, unique relationship that um, California set up recently where there's direct residential participation and demand response markets facilitated through aggregators. And so this is a neat idea. A lot of people say, well, you know, you're not going to get people to care that much about, you know, in interacting with their energy usage information. Well, there's a lot of companies in Silicon Valley that made people care about a lot of what I think could be silly games that people spend hours doing on the internet. And if you borrow some of those gamification concepts and bring them to energy, you can actually have a significantly higher engagement with users, something much more than the you know, seven or eight minutes a year that, that people often talk about is uh, the time spent thinking about utility bills. Uh, here's another great example. Uh, with green button data, one thing customers can do is they can uh, use this, this uh, a free service to upload their green button data and see what the, the payback and ROI of solar will be on their particular rooftop. So if you don't trust your, uh, the sales person who gave you a price quote from a solar company, you want to find it out for yourself. Uh, you locate your house on, on Google Maps, you find out the azimuth, that's the, uh, the, the, the angles there that you see in, in red, and you can upload your file and that tells you, based on some, some NREL calculations, exactly what the payback of solar is going to be on your particular house. Not a national average, not a state average, but for your particular house and your usage patterns. So this is really exciting if you, uh, like in California, you're on a, a default time of use rate for solar. So you can't just look at you know, my last 12 months of billing history to find out what the payback's going to be. I have to look at when do I come home from work at night? What is the, you know, peak versus off-peak consumption look like? These are important parts of the project economics that you can only determine when you have that uh, detailed granular access to usage data. Another application, this is actually one that I developed uh, with my last company, <coughs> uh, is a, a, a tool for uh, real estate owners to track the energy performance in uh, disparate facilities. So um, you may not know that there are trillions of dollars of real estate um, across the US and the world that are under obligations to report their um, energy and uh, emissions information to investors like pension funds. So um, there's a lot of interest in having uh, you know, enterprise-wide access to energy usage information and to continue to improve their energy performance over time. So in this example, you could say, oh, my Atlanta office is bright red. It seems like I want to focus some energy, uh, some, some effort on, a, on a energy efficiency in that location, whereas the ones that are green and yellow, I can worry about those later. So this is only possible when you have access to energy usage information in a consistent format, regardless of which zip code you live in. So there's two important um, uh, standards here. Uh, one got mentioned um, earlier, but, but Green Button has not. So I'll, I'll start mentioning, uh, start describing Green Button first. So Green Button um, was originally called Open ADE, was the requirement standard, Open Automated Data Exchange. And that's typically your 15 minute or 60 minute data collected from the meter. And it can also include your, your billing uh, history and, and things like your account number and things like that. So that information is, is collected by the utility and through the green button standard, the customer authorizes a third party to access that information in, in an automated way. So you may be familiar with uh, uh, a number of services online like LinkedIn or Twitter or Facebook where you can use your login and password um, to those services on other websites. For example, you can make a comment on the New York Times uh, article online by logging in with Facebook. Well, it's a similar sort of idea where I can log in, in in California and other states, I can log in to my utilities website and say, I want to exchange my usage data uh, with you know, Acme Energy or any of the uh, <coughs> 60 or 70 companies that are registered with the California utilities to provide energy information services. So it's a, it's a widely known technology. 
Um, and this is being used, uh, like I said, in about there, there's policies in place for 25 million meters across the U.S. So uh, in my view, this is an important way of getting customers in the driver's seat so they can choose who, with whom do I want to exchange this information. If I don't want to, well, that's fine. But if you know my friends are talking about this app and it sounds really interesting and I can earn points on it, and there's all sorts of motivators that would bring people to interact with this information, um, and consumers as well as businesses. So uh, it's, it's a great opportunity to get some extra value from the, the data that's collected by meters. The second standard uh, is the home area network. Um, and we've talked a little bit about this earlier today, um, but it's a more granular uh, real-time radio transmission from the meter, uh, which allows a, a slightly uh, more in-depth set of applications to, to do analysis. So for example, uh, on the left here, uh, these are measurement intervals collected by a, a green button system, say in California, where there's once an hour meter readings. So in order to do some statistical analysis, you need to look at much longer periods of time. Whereas uh, on the right are the readings from the home area network system, which could be every eight to 10 seconds. So you can get very granular to look, uh, help, help customers inside the home understand, you know, what turned on right now? Um, was that, you know, uh, an electric vehicle? Was that your electric stove that turned on and so on? And if it turns out it's an electric stove, well, here are some rebates to buy a more efficient one from your local Home Depot, something like that. So each, uh, the, the, technolo the technologies that are enabled uh, in your state can, can kind of determine which technologies and value propositions will make the most sense for customers. Um, if the home area network is available, that's, you know, that's sort of one pathway you can go down. Um, and green button information, whether it's you know, monthly uh, utility readings or you know, hourly or 15 minute data, that's another set. So finally, <coughs> um, I'd like to, to ask you to uh, consider the Commission's own role in, in setting of standards. I think it's, we've heard a lot about standards and interoperability today, and those are very important concepts, um, but it's also important to realize that the industry by itself often doesn't adhere to standards particularly closely, right? Because, um, you know, in capitalist society, there's a lot of benefits financially to be had from diverging from uh, standards, making your own island that everyone has to interact with you, right, to become the ultimate platform where everyone ad adapts to you as opposed to you having to adapt to everyone else, right, because there's costs incurred in that process. And so um, <clears throat> this is an interesting example. Uh, the American South actually had multiple uh, railway gauges, uh, and this is one of the reasons why the Confederacy um, had much more limited supplies in the Civil War than, than uh, the North did, and that's because every time you had to move your uh, a freight from the, the, the tracks that are in red to the tracks that are in green, you had to unload all the, all the cars and, and take the cargo and put it on a new train, right, that was on, on a different railway gauge. And the same burden on commerce happens in the digital sphere as well. So the companies that are active in a number of states with green button applications, they're probably not going to come to Ohio unless Ohio adheres to that standard very closely, right? Um, because it's very difficult to have that critical mass unless there's buy-in from uh, a number of localities. So I think it's really important to have not just standards, but um, adherence to that. And I'm happy to say that there are nonprofit alliances. We've heard about like the Wi-Fi Alliance or the Zigbee Alliance. There's also one called the Green Button Alliance, which is a nonprofit organization. Uh, you can pay <coughs> a very nominal fee and have a utilities a uh, green button implementation tested to show that it actually is compliant with the standard. So you don't have to take the utility's word for it, but you as regulators can rely on uh, an independent third party certification system. Um, so I'll leave it there. Uh, that was some interesting, interesting text there. Um, I'll mention that there we have a couple reports uh, on our website, and one that's uh, coming up this fall is a, uh, it's called um, Elements of a, a Data Sharing Policy. And this is a, a 10 point plan that looks at um, how Ohio could, or any other state, could develop its own data sharing policy with regards to meter information. And it, it touches on privacy, it touches on standards, um, it touches on um, some of the uh, uh, accountability and digital uptime uh, metrics that we think are important. Um, and so you can find those on our website. Thank you very much. Thank you. Mr. Houseman. Thank you for the invitation. I appreciate the fact that you allowed me to be here today. 
Um, I'm going to go in a very different direction than the previous speaker did, and I'm going to talk specifically about standards and how we're, how we're potentially going to be able to take advantage of what we've learned from deregulation, setting up things like PJM, NIDA in the UK, and other projects like that, and thinking about where the Commission's role in standards is. So, one of the first things I heard this morning from Jeff, and, and I really appreciated it, was the whole idea of platforms. And, and the industry is not on a single platform today. It's kind of a loose formation of platforms all flying together because what I do in a building as a building owner is not what a distribution utility has as a platform, is not what a transmission utility typically has as a platform, nor a generator. And operations, markets, and others are all on their own platforms. And it's important to understand that you probably never will get them to converge to a single platform, but you can probably get them to use standards to exchange between those platforms. And that's probably the most important thing that the Commission can focus on, is how to make that exchange as seamless and easy for people to do as absolutely possible so as many different organizations can participate in the industry as possible and as many new ideas can come to the market as possible. And you've heard people talk about consumer technology. I'm going to pick on Alexa for a minute, something that Amazon's come up with. A year ago, there were fewer than 10,000 Alexas in the world. By the 1st of April, there were almost 3 million in the United States. Alexa started out with about 30 skills. That's an app for an iPhone, but they have to name it differently at Amazon. Uh, no standard in the naming, unfortunately. Um, today, there are over 15,000 skills, of which more than 4,000 deal with energy management. Now, that's both a good thing and a bad thing, and it illustrates something about standards. Okay, the fact that I have to have 4,800 apps means that there's not a lot of congruity between the way the manufacturers are creating their equipment so that you have to go out and create individual apps for each of the devices, be it light bulbs from different manufacturers or air conditioners or thermostats or other things like that. So that's a negative on what's going on. The good news is there are 4,800 different types of devices from different manufacturers that have been able, at the consumer end, to be part of an energy network as we move forward. So how do we then communicate with those devices in a way that doesn't drive a utility or a third-party aggregator out of business because of the cost to, run, to put together software? So why do we want to use standards? Well, let's start with let's not reinvent the wheel. You know, we've learned a lot of lessons, and most of the standards are written after the fact. You do 10, 12, 15 implementations, and you say, you know, I really shouldn't make that mistake again, and it goes in the standard. Germany is a wonderful case in point. When I was doing some work in Germany on their inverters, it became very clear that the German government had made a mistake. They said every inverter turns off at very specific over and under frequencies. So on a hot sunny day, beautiful day, lots of power being generated, the frequency would move in the appropriate direction and get to that point and all the distributed generation in that area would go off simultaneously. And so would all the power in that area. Three billion euros later, Germany has replaced all of those interconnects. And so we probably should learn from those mistakes rather than potentially spending billions of dollars here replacing equipment that was poorly designed and poorly mandated. It makes it much easier to specify requirements. You know, there, there's this thing called the Internet, and in the Internet they have the Internet Engineering Task Force and the Engineering Internet Task Force creates something called RFCs, Request for Comment. What that is, is the beginning of a standard. It can't be a standard until two companies independently can create software that can do what those requirements require. And if they can, then the RFC can be implemented. 
So if you write the right standards and do it correctly, then the end result is companies can interoperate. One of our greatest mistakes was the Smart Energy Profile version one. Okay, I'm gonna to toggle a light switch from my phone. Okay, that sends a one. Now, one manufacturer said, okay, that means I turn the light on. The second manufacturer said, that means I turn the light off. The third manufacturer said, okay, a one means I toggle the light switch. So if it was on, I'll turn it on. And if it was off, I'll turn it on. Or if it was on, I'll turn it off. So we need to pay attention to the testing side of things. And I'm pleased to say that an awful lot of that is being done by other organizations, user groups, and other things. But I think one of the most important things, and I'll get to it later, is end-to-end -end testing. It's not okay to just test one step in the process because the interaction up and down the stack may make a big difference. Now, another nice thing about standards is if you actually have good standards, you prevent vendor lock-in. Anybody can come in and sell compatible equipment and that means there's an opportunity to bring the price down over time and bring more innovation into the market. And then the vendors obviously can share a much larger overall market. So we typically apply standards in layers. This is the Gridwise Architecture Council stack. I didn't go to the ISO stack, which is an IT stack. I tried to pick something that included some of the business side. So down at the bottom is all the hardware, the middleware, the software, those sorts of things that we tend to think of as IT and OT. The next level up is all of our data exchange. So something like Green Button would live in that data exchange layer. And the next la level up is actually the business organization, the way the market is organized and so on and so forth. And you see there's a green box at the top, which is typically where regulation lives. This is the way we're going to do things, folks. Live within this box. And then we have separate standards as we walk down the stack for different things. All the way at the bottom, you might have a standard for Unix. All the way at the top, you might have a NASB process standard that's both been adopted by the State Commission and FERC for how to do things. And what we've got to be able to do when we test is to make sure we can work all the way up and down that stack. Now, somebody mentioned Enel this morning. I had a chance to work with Enel back in the 1990s on their meters. And one of the interesting things back in the day was they really wanted a meter reading every 60 days. And to be able to reset the demand break or the disconnect switch in the meter uh, when the customer called in and changed their tariff. That's all they wanted to be able to do. In the 1990s, that was incredibly progressive and Enel paid for it by not having to send people out to change physical breakers in the meters. They were only making about 240 million trips a year out to 27 million customers in order to change breakers and about 90% of those trips, because the breaker wouldn't fit in the meter, the guy had to go back to the shop and get more breakers of the right size. Because all of those meters were built by small Italian companies shortly after World War II, and there were no standards for those meters as to what size the breakers needed to be. Now, that meant they needed about 30 bytes of data, about six words, a month out of those meters. So to have a metering system that would do eight characters a second was perfectly fine. Even if I've got 2,500 or 3,000 customers on a transformer, which is not unusual in Europe, 30, 30 you know, bits a second, plenty of time to get that data out every two months. Fast forward to now. We've got all the inverters going in for PV and other things like that. We want to be able to read those meters every 15 minutes. We want to bring back voltage data. We want to bring back consumption and demand on each of the three phases. And all of a sudden, we go from 30 bytes a month to 30 bytes a minute per meter. It's not fast enough anymore. Not even close to fast enough anymore. So while the original Italian standard was perfectly fine 25 years ago, because the requirements have evolved, the standard needs to evolve. And that's something we need to pay 
attention to as we move forward. If you think back to the original business transactions that were put down by PJM for retail, those were all EDI transactions, electronic data interchange transactions, that had very specific formats. And one of the big problems with setting up PJM originally, and especially the Pennsylvania market, was you had to test with every peer you were going to exchange data with. One of the lessons we learned out of that that was used in Ontario was, we're going to set up one testing hub for all of Ontario. If you certify with that testing hub, you're done. You can exchange with anybody. It took 11 months off the time to set up the market. It took almost a year off to agreeing to do new transactions. Now, the other thing that came out of both of those was, in every case, every stakeholder who wanted a seat at the table to develop those standards was offered a seat at the table and listened to. And if you're going to develop transactional standards between platforms, whether it's the consumer CT platform and the OT platform or a third-party platform or whatever, the more people you can bring to the table, the more engaged they are in the standard development, the more they're going to feel ownership for it and the better chance you're going to have of getting it implemented and complied with. So, you know, what do we want to do with standards? Well, we want to understand what we need, not how to do it, but what we need. So what does the connector need to look like? How does it fit in? Anybody ever gone and looked at all the different end connectors for USB? There's probably 50 different configurations of USB end connectors at this point, and at least a half a dozen of them belong to Apple. So one company, and they can't even figure out what their connector needs to look like to go into their devices. They just keep goofing around with it to come up with something else. Um, what information needs to be exchanged? So do I need demand? Do I need usage? Do I need account numbers? What needs to go back and forth? How do I name that data? This is one of the biggest problems we have right now in the industry. Every utility has their own dialect. Every manufacturer has their own dialect. And because they do, they name things differently. You want to have some fun. I have a 15,000 page manual from SAP that tells you how they name all of their smart grid data. I've got a 5,000 page manual from Oracle that tells you how they name all of their smart grid data. There's some compatibility in there, but there's more differences than there is compatibility in the names of the data. You know, who's permitted to talk on the network and when? If I'm bringing back emergency information on outages, should the bulk data from a meter be allowed to proceed over the top of those emergency messages, or should the emergency messages have priority? What's the format I'm going to use? I'll go back to the, you know, Pennsylvania example. And what frequency and, and signals are used? So do I pull data once a day from my field information, including outage? So I had an outage at 8 o'clock in the morning. I pulled the data at 2 o'clock the next morning, and I roll a truck at 3 o'clock in the morning. Is that good service to my customer? Probably not. But those are the sorts of things that we need to think about and I can guarantee that when you get into the rural areas, you'll have different answers than when you're in the urban areas because of the density of communication and the number of messages that need to fly. That doesn't mean you need different standards, it just means you need to pay attention. And somebody was asking, well, what about the rural folks? Are they sophisticated? Well, my neighbor across the street, who's a farmer, and my neighbor next to him, who's a farmer, both have VSAT on their roofs, and they're both on commodity trading exchanges every day dealing with commodity futures for what they do. They've got energy management systems that put the one in my house to shame. So don't think that just because somebody lives in a rural area that they don't have good technology and they aren't interested. And then there are different functions that we want to perform. Now, when we look at a smart grids communications network or a grid modernization communications network, we can layer in all different kinds of standards along the way. But if you're going to focus on where it's going to make the biggest difference, 
it's those yellow bridges between those domains where it makes the most sense to try and get people to agree to or reg re write the appropriate regulatory orders in order to put a standard in place. And you can see in some cases all we've got are proprietary standards to work with. One of my favorites is Honeywell. They have one factory that makes package units to go on the roof of commercial buildings. They use a standard called BACnet, but every product team has extended BACnet differently. So I have one building with one floor of engineers who over the last decade have turned out 22 different incompatible versions of BACnet for the same piece of equipment. And that's one of the things that we're going to have to figure out how to deal with as we go forward. Even though they're all standard, everybody's extended it differently. And why? Well, standards have options. C12.19, which is an ANSI standard that lays out the data tables in the meters, the 2003 version, let you create a grand total of eight incompatible meters. There were very few options in it. Fast forward to 2013 when the new version of C12 was ratified. I can follow the standard and I can create almost a quarter million incompatible different data tables because of all of the options in the standards. Part of that comes from the fact that the utilities have gotten less and less involved in the standards activities over the last 15 years. I can't tell you why they have, but they have. And so it's far more vendor driven in this day and age. AEP, First Energy, used to be two of the most active utilities in standards development. They're some of the least active utilities in standards development, at least in the groups I see today. So one of the things you need to be able to do is you need to create an application specific protocol that goes along with the standard. So for this option, I choose A. For this option, I choose C. For this next option, I choose B. And in that way, you do away with the incompatibilities and you make the testing that much cleaner. And if that goes into RFPs and other documents like that, it forces the vendors to do the right things. And I thank you very kindly for your time. Thank you very much. Now, John, did you want to do a quick summary piece? Sure. Yeah, this will be real quick. Um, I think the example Michael gave of Green Button, you know, is a, is a really good one because it was during the time we had the smart grid interoperability panel and uh, the U.S., the chief technology officer of the United States challenged our industry with Green Button. And the model for Green Button was Blue Button, which is what we talked about, Christina, before about Blue Button was... Can a vet press a blue button and get all their health information from all these disparate platforms that, that were proprietary? And there was an industry-wide effort to do that. Well, then the U.S. CTO said, let's do something similar with energy usage. where We press a green button, and we can any, any end-use customer can get their energy usage information, again, from different platforms, you know, and that, that kind of thing. So... Um, we showed that it could happen, right? What standards were needed were developed and, and the platform. And there's, as Michael said, many, many successful users, you know, that can, uh, in a sense, press a button and get their energy usage information. So I think that's a very good example for us going forward. Um, Doug gave a good summary on, you know, we've talked about why we use standards, but Doug had a really good summary of, of um, why standards are necessary um, and I think a good point is and this is difficult to do when when we get together to write a standard we don't want to write about what we've done in the past as Doug said we want to we want to want to look to the future and we want to write a standard about where the industry is going but if we if we had that crystal ball you know that told us what the future exactly was going to be it'd, it'd be easy easier task so as Doug said, as requirements evolve, standards should evolve too. That's why we get, you know, the best group, and, and, and it should be a balanced stakeholder group, as Doug said. Utilities, vendors, consultants, you know, all, all balanced. And all of us give our 
expert input on what we think the future is going to be, and that's what we focus on when we when we write a standard. The real difficulty of this is not while we're looking forward, we also need to look backwards because we have, as we said earlier, a lot of legacy equipment, and we can't shut that out with a new standard. We have the new equipment with new standards needs to coexist with existing equipment and older standards. And then one last thing would be writing a standard, um, if you try to please everybody, you get in a situation, as Doug said, where you have so many options. If I'm a GE, if I, if, I, if I develop a piece of equipment for a standard, I choose the options that make sense for me. Another vendor chooses the options that make sense with them. And Beth, that's why we need PlugFest, because <laughs> all the vendors <laughs> have chosen a different set of options. And when we connect our equipment together, it, and it complies with the same standard, it doesn't talk to each other, right? And so that's why compliance to the standard with, with the options we've chosen is far from guaranteeing interoperability, right? Because so there's a fine line between having so many options you're trying to please everybody and truly having a standard that, that is real that we can not only comply with but have a chance of interoperability. <laughs> All right. Thank you. Thank you, John. Okay. Christina. Um, Michael, I have a question for you. Um, with Green Button Connect, and um, on your chart, you showed that you know it's under consideration in Ohio, and it's uh, come up in a few different cases before the commission here. Um, but as it was originally conceived, was it intended that, and this kind of goes to the different um, data flows, but like we have EDI transactions that are used primarily between the EDU and what we call the CRES or the marketers in the state. Was it intended to encompass that data flow as well, or was it more intended to be for these third-party applications? Because I think one of the challenges that we've seen in Ohio is there's already this existing data flow for billing purposes, for instance, versus, say, an application developer that wants to provide a service but isn't necessarily providing the commodity service. Um, so I guess... Just general comment on that, you know, the, the, the original intent and then challenges associated with kind of the, the different data flows that exist already and kind of getting into legacy processes at least. Um, it's a great question. Um, <clears throat> so EDI, I think, originated in the 70s before the Internet existed as a way for large companies like maybe GE or Honeywell or others to... Um, uh, receive invoices from their suppliers and pay people pay their vendors on time and we had thousands and thousands of SKUs and thousands of vendors that you know you needed that system for electronically handling that uh, you know the times have changed um, I think you know uh, there may be you know I uh, so I don't I don't have a problem with EDI um, it's you know it's what a lot of in the competitive uh, states you know it's fairly fairly common to have EDI um, but there are you know a million versions of EDI. So just because there's one in Ohio doesn't mean that's going to work in Pennsylvania. Um, and so that's a, I think, a significant barrier um, to, you know, apps, for example, where you know once you're in the app store, you're in, you know, hundreds of millions of smartphones across the U.S. So, um, you know, you want to have something as uniform as possible. Um, so green button, I know, is. Um, is under consideration in uh, in states like New York for um, handling some of the interval data from meters. So um, there's, uh, you know, and that that's sort of you know every time you go from you know one standard to the next standard, it's it's always a difficult um, <laughs> transition, and a lot of companies have like sunk costs and investments on the old standard, and so they don't want to move to the new one. And so you know that's I think that's perfectly understandable. Um, but you absolutely can use green button um, data for um, handling usage as well as cost information. And, um, and it's actually being used uh, in states like uh, California right now to settle demand response transactions with the ISO. Very good. Uh, Commissioner Conway, anything? One question for Doug. Uh, um, the <coughs> The scenario or the, the reality that you describe 
that exists for um, existing standards and the variations that are possible to have that are, are legitimate in the sense that they comply with the standard and yet are different and lead, would lead apparently to interoperability questions um, is a kind of a dismal picture. Um, is it dismal or is there some way for us to fire our way out of the morass that the all these different variations uh, of, of, the, of the same standard would permit and still allow the implementer to be abiding by the standard? Well, having watched Green Button evolve from the first day at the SGIP and the first meeting at the SGIP, I can say that when you get the right stakeholders in the room and they're engaged, you can fight your way out. If you look at the IEEE 1547 uh, revision that was just voted on, 90% uh, of the options that were in the early drafts were taken out of it in the final draft, and it was cleaned up because people were engaged. If you go back and look at what happened in Pennsylvania and Ohio and Illinois with the EDI transactions, 99% of the options in those transactions were removed because people were engaged. It's about getting people engaged and having standards that really matter and getting all the stakeholders around the table to make it work. And, and that's why I'm encouraging you as you look at those yellow bridge areas in that diagram to focus there because that's where you'll bring the most stakeholders to bear and you'll have the biggest impact on improving standards. Doug, in the existing sta in with with standards that exist today, in thinking about the grid mod space, based upon your experience and your level of expertise, what are standards that you think this commission should take a really, really hard look at that exist today? I, I really didn't want to get into standards, and it's a great question, but I, I've got my opinions. These are my personal opinions. They are not the IEEE's opinions. They are not Burns and McDonald's opinions. They are not anybody else's opinions, and John McDonald will throttle me <laughs> if, if I try to put any of those organizations on this because we work together at the IEEE. But one of the first ones in my mind is one that everybody poo-poos, which is uh, multi-speak, because it is very clear this is the transaction, this is the way transaction works, this is the way the data is laid out, there are no variations allowed in any transaction. These are the tests that you have to run and the hurdles you have to jump to be compliant. And if you talk to Oracle, you talk to SAP, you talk to GE, you talk to almost any of the other vendors, because they've had to, they've actually implemented big chunks of multi-speak. So when it comes to integration, the IBMs, the Accentures, and the people of, like that hate multi-speak because it cuts the integration budget by 50 to 70 percent uh, when you put it in place. Um, and, and so that's one of the standards I truly believe in. DNP3 is another standard that I truly believe in because it makes it possible to do an awful lot in the substations and as you begin to look at extending it out into the field it also does an awful lot in a way that all of the vendors have agreed to do the same things around to a large extent. So it's relatively simple to implement and straightforward. And because of things like Goose and the IP version of DNP3, it's also a relatively modern and extensible standard over time. Very good. Thank you very much. Tom? Yeah, I just wanted to. I want to come back to Doug and his remarks about rural uh, areas. And I, uh, I don't think that you thought I was talking about how smart they were. I'm talking about the services to rural areas, areas where they have no or little cell phone service, areas that have no or little broadband areas. Uh, areas that have, uh, do not have smart meters and, uh, um, you know, and, and will not see them in the foreseeable future. And uh, I mean, that was what, and I think the previous panel understood what I was talking about and came back with a good answer. They didn't, I mean, we have, uh, 
you know, outstanding people in rural areas. Yeah, that wasn't it. It was, uh, it was um, more like uh, they're helping pay for some of these services and not getting them. So I grew up in the western, northwestern portion of the Upper Peninsula of Michigan. We didn't get electricity until I was 10. Okay, uh, we got one television channel growing up. The house I grew up in a decade ago got its smart meter. Um, we have broadband service in that area uh, because of an initiative that the commission undertook and the FCC undertook to allow for broadband in rural areas. Now, I'm not going to argue that all rural areas have that, but my nearest neighbor growing up was a mile and a half away. The town I grew up in had a population of 2,020, 2,000 head of cattle and 20 people. <laughs> so I, I understand your question, and, and I understand where you're coming from, and I agree that they may or may not get the services, but it is, and I can take you to my hometown, and show you that the utilities actually can provide those services locally in a rural area. And the folks in those areas understand and will uptake those services as well or better as many of the urban customers do because the utility costs are a far bigger chunk of their disposable income than folks in the city because darn it, I can take my deer rifle out and go get me a deer during season and put it in the freezer and that's a lot of meat I don't have to buy at the grocery store. Acceptable? <laughs> <laughs> huh? I I'm out of my element on this one, guys. I'm not going to lie. I'm not going to lie to you. I'm just sort of witnessing. Uh, we are all, it's like the LeBron James, we're all witnesses. So this is very good. Okay, uh, Beth, you want to follow that one? <laughs> Now I still like my plug fest one, but good job, Tom. Um, I'm just curious, have there any states done a good job at dealing with standards, incentivizing standards, um, or commissions? I mean, when I say states, I don't know, state legislature, state commissions. Have, have any of them done a good job at doing anything like that? So if you look at California with their Rule 21 and some of the other rules that they put in place, and the stakeholder meetings that have come out of those, and then the longer-term development of statewide standards, they've probably been the most engaged. If you take a look at the Illinois Collaborative that went on almost a decade ago around uh, grid modernization and so on and so forth, even though the commission and the legislature had a big food fight over it, I think they did a wonderful job in setting that collaborative up in, in making it run, and it came out with some pretty good ideas and some pretty good standards recommendations. And Michigan right now has three proceedings that are multi-stakeholder underway, one for demand response, one for distributed generation, and a third one for future rates. And, and that seems to all be going in a pretty good direction with a lot of interaction, and some of that interaction is pretty sharp. But I think that's knocking a lot of edges off and, and puncturing a lot of myths right now about how this works or that works because people are having to come to the table with proof. And so I think that's going to make a difference in Michigan in the long run on how they deal with standards and how the grid actually forms up in the long run. But can I ask you a question about this? So this to me seems like a stakeholder process that a lot of state, state commissions um, embark upon and then they draft an order, say here's here was the stakeholder process, boom, 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 boom. Is that a standard to you? Do you, I mean, is that? No, 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 no. no. So in California, Rule 21 actually came up with this is a phase one standard for the interconnect and the inverter. Here's the phase two standard. Here's the phase three standard, which then IEEE picked up and fed into the rewrite of IEEE 1547, which is the interconnect standard for distributed resources to the grid. When I look at Michigan right now, a lot of the, the DR stuff 
is looking at things like open ADR and other standards along those lines and saying, which of these can I actually implement as part of the order? And, and who's going to be for and against that? And what's the impact of doing that on different stakeholders in the state? Gotcha. So the standards that you're talking about, which is I think where my head was before you started mentioning these state proceedings, um, the standards that you're talking about are generally speaking developed, whether it's by a nonprofit entity or a think tank that has gotten a bunch of stakeholders in a room to say, hey, here's here's a problem, how do we collectively solve it? And then states go about either adopting or tweaking a bit. Uh, yes and no. Uh, Rule 21 in California was developed by the stakeholder group. Okay. And the commission ran that stakeholder group and they hired a couple of outside consultants to actually manage that group to an end point. In, in Michigan, they're taking developed standards and throwing them against the wall and saying, will this work for all the stakeholders in the state? So they're two completely different processes, but they're both multi-stakeholder processes. California has gone further out on a limb more often to develop new standards than, than any of the other commissions. And, and I'm not going to say whether that's good or bad. They just have. Very good. And we've got um, Michael, go ahead. Uh, just a quick comment is that I think this is where you can really rely on either, you know, standards development organizations um, or on the federal government. Um, I, I, a lot of this has already been done, so there really is no need to reinvent the wheel. Um, California's work on smart inverters is really important because most of the inverters in the entire United States are located in the state of California. So that was something very particular to that state that they had to deal with. Um, but you know, not so not all standards are created equal to to officially become a, like an IEEE standard or standard through the North American Energy Standards Board, like Green Button is. You know, there's a there's a, a accreditation process you have to go through, certain processes um, to you know make sure that every, you know, stakeholder input is incorporated and and so on. So by relying on some of those you know formalized standards, you don't have to do the work yourself. Okay. Very good. Any other questions from the dais? Nope. Doug, Michael, thank you very much. John, as always, thank you very much. <laughs>